Today we will talk about the um, pigments, old natural uh, pigments, and then we will talk about uh, salt, which was another chemical uh, used by the Sumerians. Uh, So we see that the first chemical that the uh, human beings used were the old pigments. When we say pigments, they are powdered minerals. They are unorganic materials, compounds, like iron oxides, etc. And uh, they are not soluble. Therefore, when we see a, a yağlı boya in, in, in Turkish, they use pigments or or, or the uh, suluboya that you use, usually they are pigments. Or plastic paints, they use pigments. But when you dye a textile, you use dye, as the name indicates. They are soluble materials, and they are organic compounds, as we mentioned before, either from plants or, or some animals. Now, when we look at the history, the oldest chemists, we can say that goes back to 43,900 years ago, and uh, they, paint, they uh, printed the images of their hands. Have you ever seen an image of ancient people on the cave walls? Any picture? Anybody see? Did, you, did, did anyone see? Did you see it? Okay. So that's how they did it. In, in, in, in the cave, they put their hand on the rock, and then they took some pigment into their mouth, suspended, let's say, in maybe oil or something. Then they just blew onto the hand. And then when they removed their hand, the, the, the print of the hand was produced on the wall of the cave. Okay? I, I'll show you the picture. So that was about 43,900 years ago. And later on, since they were using the pigments, later on they painted figures on the walls of the caves. Has anyone seen any, any, any photograph which shows the uh, drawings of the ancient man on cave walls? Animals, they usually uh, painted animals. And that goes back to 42,000 years ago. And it was found in, in, in, uh, in the walls uh, in a cave in Spain. Then uh, we also see that uh, these figures are, uh, are in Malaga. When I said Spain, it's in Malaga. Now you can see the prints of the hands, which was first produced by cavemen 43,900 years ago in a cave. This is in Indonesia. Now, this is, of course, a very simple painting, but it is, it represents a small animal, like a fish or something. This is in Malaya, Spain, 42,000 years ago. So when it's red, it's iron oxide. Uh, pus, yani, iron oxide, red-orange pigment. Now, you can see the beautiful ox, horse, and gooses on the wall of uh, a French cave, which called La Soux, 16,000 years ago. I'm sure that when we give a piece of paper to the students of Middle East Technical University and say, why don't you draw some horses and, and some oxes on the paper, I don't think that many of them uh, uh, will be able to draw Pictures as beautiful as this one is unbelievable. 16,000 years ago, look at the quality and the beauty of the, uh, the paintings. Now, I said that we call pigments when we obtain a substance which is colored from the ground, from rocks. In Turkish, we call them toprak boyas. In English, it's called okra. okra. Toprak boyas or okra. Is, is the cheapest uh, pigment that you can find. I think it's around five lira or 10 lira per kilogram, so cheap, because it's, it's just powdered uh, mineral, iron oxide. And uh, 
when we look at the uh, colors, we can see their chemical composition. Yellow is well known, and it, since it's, it's similar to lemon, it's called limonite. The, the name of the mineral is limonite. It is iron oxide, which is hydrated iron oxide. Red, just like uh, orange one, it's again iron oxide, but anhydrous iron oxide it is, and it's called hematite. The purple is very similar to the red ochre, but uh, it contains uh, some gypsum, that is calcium sulfate, and some calcite, that is calcium carbonate. Brown is again uh, iron hydroxide. Uh, it's called gotate or gotite. It's partly hydrated iron oxide. This is the picture of the mineral, original mineral of hematite and limonite. Now, they use red ochre or kırmızı toprak boyası for painting of a bison on a cave, which is uh, painted in Spain around 16,000 BC or 15,000 BC. You, you can again see the beautiful uh, figures. That's 16,000 years ago. So I always say that many people think that the cavemen are stupid. They are wild and stupid. They are not. That maybe they are not as smart as we are because we have learned a lot and that helps perhaps to, to develop developments in our brain. But they were not stupid. They were not like animals because unfortunately when uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the, the certain kinds of uh, uh, cavemen later on, but when the first people realized that ancient people lived in, in caves, in some movies and in some cartoons, caricatures, uh, they draw them as people with big beard and like animal and very stupid face and they have a, a big stick and then they hit the, the woman and then take them away from her cave to his, his cave to be his wife or something. But that was all imaginary. It has nothing to do with reality. You can see that if those people could paint such beautiful uh, paintings, they were smart. And we will see the things that they discovered thousands of years ago. They were not stupid. So I can tell you that some of people think that uh, the people maybe lived 5,000 years ago. They were all stupid. No, they were as smart as we are. If just, you know, bring a Sumerian boy or a man to this classroom, shave them and then put them on normal dresses. You cannot recognize they are, uh, 5,000, they are from 5,000 years ago. So they were as smart as you are. Now, has anyone been to uh, Italy, Parma? You know the city Parma, right, in Italy? Everybody knows or not? Parma? Yok, Parma diye bir şey duymadık mı? Parma, well, maybe. Many years ago, Parma, name of Parma was very famous because th there were some Turkish Football players played in Parma uh, team. Uh, it's a beautiful city. Uh, this pigment is called Parma yellow. Of course, you, you can find various limonites in different places. Their tone of the color is different from each other. So this is a very specific limonite. Perhaps it has some impurities. And when you walk on the streets of Parma, you can see many houses and many government buildings painted yellow. It's called Parma yellow. As I said, salt uh, was also used thousands of years ago. The reason it was discovered by a caveman, or even before perhaps, uh, in early, early people, even earlier than the people who lived in caves, because we as human beings and the animals, we all need sodium chloride. Without sodium chloride, we cannot have a long life. We die very early. Animals also. So when you see a goat uh, licking some rocks, they are licking salt rock because they need rock. Also, uh, in, in some villages, uh, when they uh, have uh, various uh, goats, they also carry uh, rock salt so that the, uh, the, the goats can lick because they need it. Otherwise, they lick other rocks. They may be poisonous. So salt, we needed it. And then the caveman discovered that salt was tasted good. Actually, it doesn't taste good. Our brains tricks us and says, 
eat this, this is good. Now, everybody in this classroom and in the world, you like sweet. You like baklava, you like kadaif or, or, or cakes. And you, think, you say that it's good, good, it tastes good. Actually, it doesn't taste good. It's just that's the food. But your brain tricks you because brain likes you to consume sugar. When you consume sugar, you convert it to energy immediately. The brain needs energy more than the... But he tells you that he needs energy because he is, he is dominant. So brain sucks up uh, the, the sugar energy before the rest of your body. Sugar is the easiest material to decompose to give energy in your body. That's why we think that we like it. And then the body, again, brain tricks us, says, go and eat some flour, some bread. Everybody likes bread. Because the reason is that when you take bread into your mouth and chew slightly, the enzyme in your mouth decomposes flour or starch into two pieces of sugar. So that's why we like sugar and we like bread. And when we put them together, we'll all love cakes. And the other one, if you cannot find, or the brain says, tells you, if you didn't find any sugar, if you didn't find any uh, flour or bread, when you go, to go and find some oil, it takes much longer for oil to decompose, to give energy to the brain. So when you put it all together, sugar, flour, and oil, that's baklava or, or kadaif, that's why you like them, because you, your brain tells you that they are good, they taste good. It, actually, it has nothing to do with taste, but it is the, the, the trick of our brain, because, as I said, it needs energy. Therefore, our body also needed salt, and they told the people, human beings, thousands and thousands of years ago, if you licked salt rock, that, was, that tasted beautiful. You felt comfortable because you needed salt. When you ate it, you feel relaxed and happy. Okay? It doesn't mean it tastes good. It means that you need it. Okay. Now, salt was very important in history. Uh, it was used as salary, marsh for soldiers and other, or government employees. It was so valuable that you, you went to, to market to buy a sheep. If you gave salt, the man would be very happy to exchange because original uh, marketing was just exchange, takas. They didn't have money, but salt was the first material to be used uh, as money. Now, the word salary in English, salary, it comes from salt, OK? In Latin, salary it represents salt. So, salary, the word salary, marsh, comes from salt. And it was first commercially produced in China about 6,000 years ago because they had a lake, just like Tuzgul in, in Turkey. They had a salt lake, so they produced and sold salt 6,000 years ago. So, I, I, I forgot to mention the Neolithic areas. We have Paleolithic areas. Time, which, is, which goes back to, uh, let's say, uh, three million years or two, two, two and a half million years, down to uh, uh, 10,000 or six, 7,000. That's Paleolithic, Yont Matash Devri in Turkish. But unfortunately, Neolithic time was translated into Turkish with a wrong name. In many schools, maybe in some universities, they say, Cilalı taş devri. Kaba taş devri, cilalı taş devri. Öyle, öyle mi söylüyor hocalar hala? Kaba taş, cilalı taş devri. Yok mu öyle bir kelime? İyi, demek ki kaldırmışlar. Okay, so Paleolithic is the earliest era of human beings. When we say Neolithic, it means new stone age. N near stone age, new stone age. It's old stone age, ancient stone age. Near, but in Turkish, they used to call it kabataş, cilalataş. Okay, I, I'm glad that they don't use it anymore. Now, of course, uh, primitive man was smart enough to know the value of gold because it's scarce. Something is valuable, very valuable, if it is scarce. If you, can, if you cannot find it everywhere, I mean, if I ask you to bring out gold, maybe you would have some rings or something, but not too much. So, 
One of the reasons they liked gold just because it was scarce, it was not found easily, and the other thing is it doesn't rust, it doesn't decompose. It can uh, stay with you during the rest of your life or the rest of the life of the earth because it doesn't, it's not oxidized easily, it doesn't rust, and it's very shiny. And it's soft, it's easy to handle it, it's easy to shape it. So it was always valuable. They found it on, on, on, on, on just on, on any place because around the mountains or on the streets, wherever. It was easy to find gold. I mean, not so easy, but it, they were just on the ground, naturally. You don't have to take iron and then process some chemical processes to produce metallic gold. But for iron, yes, you cannot find iron easily on the ground. You have to take iron oxide and process it and convert it to uh, iron metal by removing the oxide. It's not an easy process. That's why iron was used or being processed by, by human beings much later than gold. So gold uh, was known around uh, 6000 BC. Then copper around 4200 uh, it was used. Copper, you could find big chunks of copper also, naturally. But today, of course, we cannot depend on natural met metallic gold, metal copper. We process copper oxide or some copper uh, minerals. Silver, around 4,000 uh, years ago, and uh, it was also found big chunks of silver. Of course, again, we have silver chloride or other silver minerals, but uh, Cayman was lucky to find gold mines, and today we still have some gold mines and we still have some silver mines. They are in metallic form. Lead was around 3500 BC, it was uh, started to be used. Tin around 1750. Iron has a different story. Uh, you couldn't find iron, as I said, on the ground in metallic form, but sometimes you did. But it was not formed under the ground. It was the meteorites coming from the space. So when you have iron coming down to earth as a meteorite, it melts and then falls down. And the meteorites are not pure iron. They are usually iron nickel, nickel uh, alloy. So Hittites were very smart and lucky to find many meteorites on Anatolia, and then they discovered that you could heat it and then shape it up. So they were the first, perhaps, civilization in the world who produced iron materials and exported them. But of course, it was rare. There are some stories about the, um, about the, uh, the king of Hittite and, and the king of uh, uh, a Babylonian uh, city in Mesopotamia. Many kingdoms were small cities. So the king of small Babylonian uh, city wrote a letter to Hittite Empire and asked him to send some iron. He said, look, uh, I will send. Usually the kings, Hittite kings, sent gifts to the other kings in the other countries kings of the other countries, because when you presented a valuable uh, gift, then you could be good friends with that country, or you sent your daughter to marry the king, or he sent his daughter to you to get married. Either you exchanged your daughters, or you sent them very valuable uh, substances so that you could have friendship and you would prevent war between the countries. And that's a written document, he says, well, it's not easy to find, but we will see in a, in a short time, we will try to find some and then we'll produce and send it to you. So it's so valuable that one king asks another king to please send me a dagger, hancher, made out of iron. Okay, so uh, iron was first produced from meteorite, but much later, again, Hittites discovered that you could produce it from the mineral. Mercury uh, was started to be used around 750 BC. There is a story about the mercury. In Middle Ages, many kings in Europe 
uh, they were amazed with the property of, of, of mercury because when you put mercury in a, in a container, anything you put on it, it just swims, you see? So if you have a big container, a pool, fill it with mercury, you can sit on it and then you just move on the mercury. So when they accepted some ambassadors of other countries, the European kings like to sit on mercury on a pillow and just move around on the mercury. So they impressed the, the ambassador when he, when he goes back. He says, this guy is funny. It's unbelievable. He just swims on a, on a, on a, on a liquid. Because not everybody knew the properties of mercury, which is not, it's not very common. It's, it's hard to find, but many, many civilizations were able to uh, find it and use it. It's found nat in, na nat as a natural met uh, metal, I wouldn't say metal, but natural uh, elements. But of course, you can produce it from the uh, mineral also. So most of the mercury we use today are obtained from the mineral, removing the oxide or sulfide. Now, as I mentioned, first iron processing, the iron which came from meteorites, was in Anatolia. This is in our museums. It was found in Alajahuyuk. It's the oldest iron dagger, which is decorated with beautiful gold. So when you go to the museum, you can, you can see it in the museum. Now, there is... The, the, the, the scientists discovered something very strange when they saw those prints and paintings on the cave walls. They noticed that next to the paintings, there were some symbols like X or circle or triangle or square or even hashtag. The funny thing is that the uh, symbols were found next to the uh, cave paintings were similar, found in Anatolia, found in Spain, in South, South Africa, South America, North America. So they were like circles, something like elliptical structure, triangle, square, or rectangle, or even hashtag, thousands of years ago. So we don't actually know when they started to speak because first speech, definitely, I mean, we, as we think, but I am very sure, everybody is almost sure that you, you communicated with each other by hands and by mouth or by action. When you, everywhere in the world, when you say like, when you do like this, that means come, come, come over here, come with me, come next to me, like this. When you say this, don't come, stop, stop, you see, that's everywhere in the world, similar actions, you see. When you go like this, you mean you want to eat, or you, when you say like this, you want to drink. So this is international. It, it, it's a natural action everywhere in the world. So, but when we saw these symbols, or sometimes they're called doodles, uh, people think that, scientists think that, somehow they communicated with these symbols. You can see. Uh, it, in different parts of the country, North America, South America, Europe, Africa, India, Indonesia, Australia, everywhere, many of them were similar. It's very strange. Görebiliyor musunuz bilmiyorum ama paralellik görülebiliyor mu oradan? Gör mesela bak çok bozuk çıktı ya maalesef. Elips şeklinde burası. Burası dikdörtgen. Burası çarpı. Bak hashtag burada. Başka yerde de hashtag olması lazım. Şu bak hashtag burada. Bambaşka yerler. Okay. <coughs> so the paintings also helped us to discover something, but we don't still know the secret of these symbols. We, we, we, the scientists just make a scenario, and probably it's true, but if we didn't have the wall paintings, probably we wouldn't notice them. So wall paintings helped us to understand that the cavemen, they were not stupid, they were smart, and they discovered many things uh, that we, we never expected them to do. Now, I mentioned that 
Uh, the primitive man, especially in Neolithic times, uh, exchange goods because you have many sheep, but you don't have, let's say, uh, any uh, metal, gold. So you go to the market, and then somebody has a gold, so you just give sheep and get the gold. So you sell it. Selling, but as I said before, money. So you exchange sheep for, with chicken or other animals, or maybe barley or, or wheat, or, or just bread, whatever. So you just exchange, takas. But of course, after a while, normally you just exchange goods personally. But then, if you produce lots of wheat or barley, it's much more than you can eat. Then you have to give it and take something that you needed. So you actually sold large amount of wheat, but you had to find someone to buy it. When, when you go to the market, the man says, OK, I, I, I want to buy all your wheat and barley, but I do not have enough number of goats to give it to you. OK, so what are we going to do? I will pay you definitely next year or six months later. But when you speak just like that, it's, it's, it's not uh, sufficient for you to, to believe that he's telling the truth. So they discovered that they could find a way to trust each other. So they used bones or sticks. They put marks on them. For instance, if, I, if you owe me 50 goats, then you made 50 marks. And you exchanged the same piece of uh, wood. So you break it into two. When you get together, you put the sticks together. That means it, it's true. Senet gibi. OK? So when the uh, exchange or shopping grew, you had to keep the record of the sales or exchanges. Mutlaka bir kayda geçirmek gerekiyor. Çünkü adam sahte, yani sahtekar her zaman var. Bugün de var, bugün de var. Doğal yani. Tabii eskiden daha da fazla olabilir. Hoş bugünküler de az değil ya. Okay. So they discovered that they could keep the track or the record of the exchanges. Now, this is called Ashanga bone. And uh, it is the oldest written record of numbers. Goes back 20,000 years. So it was found in uh, Belgium, uh, in Congo. Be Belgium, ne diyelim, Belçika, Kongosu diyoruz ya. Hani biliyorsunuz Avrupalı ülkeler genelde Afrika'nın pek çok e, şehrini, eyaletini sömürge yapmışlardı. İngilizler, Fransızlar, Hollandalılar, Belçikalılar da ufacık ülke ama işte onlar da zamanında şeymiş. Uh, so these bones uh, represent the first, or the, oh, maybe there were some, but they disappeared. So this is the oldest record of uh, the number of goods exchanged in, found in Congo. Now, of course, this method was sufficient for many years. But later on, they said, we have to find something else. This is not enough. And uh, this problem uh, uh, arose in the uh, temples, the, the problem of the priests, and also in the palace of the kings. There were kings, they were very rich. The temples, they were very rich. Because the priests in temples actually cheated the people. They said, if you donate us some chicken or some goat, we will tell God that you gave the chicken and the goat to him. He will be very happy, and you will go to Jannet. So they always tricked and lied to the people to receive goods from people who believed that God would save them and God would send them to heaven. So they were very rich. They had big treasure. During all history, church, Kilise, Papa, he is the richest man in the world, perhaps. Because many people, many religious people, believe that if they donate to the church, they will go to heaven. The other one, kings. Many kings were actually uh, cheats. They cheated people. 
they were like dictators, but that's one thing, but they also cheated the people. So they collected everything from just like vergi uh, or tax. They just took everything. So a man, who, tax collector, comes to the village and he, they just come rush instantly with many soldiers and search every house. If they find 10 sheep, they take five of them. If they find two ox, they take one of them. So anything they find, they take half, sometimes three thirds, two thirds of the material. They say, this goes to the king, but that's a lie. The tax, the tax collector stole some of the material because when, when he collected from many villages and took it to the king, king is happy because he received a lot of goats, a lot of chicken, lots of gold, silver, everything. But he didn't know how much the tax collector cheated. That happened everywhere in the world. All the kings, all the sultans, everybody did this. Because, but, but what could they do? They have to collect tax. They had to trust the ta ta tax man, but most of the tax men, maybe all, were cheats. Everywhere in the world, in Ottoman Empire, in Europe, in England, in, in Germany, everywhere. So people hated the tax man. Well, anyway, so <coughs> the people in the palaces and the people in the temples couldn't keep the records of all the stuff coming in, just flowing in. They had to keep the records. The Sumerians were the smartest people in the world at that time to invent circular tokens. I will, I'll show you the pictures. A small circular clay, chamur, yeah, dere, dere kili, kil. So they made a small circle out of clay, just like this much, and then they put a mark on it, a cross, or, or a uh, sign of plus. So uh, something like this, when they put a plus sign, that meant one goat, or one, sorry, one sheep. So if you have two, three, four, five, when you counted them, you could report to the king or to the, to the priest that he has 150 uh, sheep in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, treasure. So that was one thing. But it helped us to discover numbers, not to us, but Sumerians, and then the alphabet. Okay? So this, so the, the terrible attitude of priests and the kings helped Sumerians to discover alpha, uh, uh, numbers and then alphabet. Because they were so rich, they had to find a way to know how rich, how rich they were. Now, these are some of the Sumerian uh, tokens. Here is a circle with a plus sign on it, that is uh, one ship. And you can see that some of them has holes on them. I will talk about them later on. So each of them represented another good. Some represented textile, some represented maybe silver, some represented maybe iron, some rep represented a, a coat or a shoe, whatever. So that's how uh, they uh, represented the richness of the king and the priest. So this was discovered by Sumerian uh, people for the first time in palaces and, and, and, and the, uh, in the uh, uh, temples. Now, later on, around 4000 BC, when you had the clay, of course, the first thing you did was to dry it under the sun, but they broke easily. So when you put 150 of them, they broke, some of them broke. So they decided, or they, they discovered that if you put them in fire in an oven and bake them, they become ceramic and much stronger. They can live for, for centuries. So Sumerians were the first people in the world who discovered these tokens and then to convert these clay tokens, dried clay tokens, into ceramic. Now, of course, this 
created some problems. We'll talk about it. And then they switched to uh, flat uh, clay tablets. We, I'll, I'll explain the detail later. Now, they, I, I show you the small holes in the previous uh, Here, the holes was to be used to bring them together. You, you had a string, you passed it through here, through here, through here. So you had a, of course, not each of them, but let's say if you have 100 of these, you put them all together on a, on a, on a string and tied it up and put it in a clay box. And it, it, well, this didn't have, but it, it, it, should, it should have. So you put them on a string and put them in a box. Now, of course, when you say box, it's not a wood box or ca a carton box. It, it, it is a cardboard box. It is clay box. They, they made a, a semi-circular uh, uh, container, kase gibi, another one. So you put the uh, uh, tokens who were on, on a string, put them in together, and then you sealed it so that you know that there are 50 uh, ships in there. But in order to remember what's in the container, they decided to make some symbols onto the uh, container so that they could remember uh, uh, how many, uh, uh, what they have inside. Now look at this. You see, here we have tokens, and then they just, this is the container, okay? They, they put the, uh, the, the shape of the, uh, uh, tokens. Bakın yavaş yavaş yazıya doğru gidiyoruz. So they put them inside and after a while they said are we stupid? Why do we need them anymore? We can just make a uh, container and then just write on them, put signs on them, right? Then they said okay, let's give up tokens and write on this is another example of uh, clay tokens and, and, and the container. It's called bula. This is called bula container. Same, you see, in different places. This is found in Susa. In, of course, most of these things are found in Iraq and Iranian border, south of Turkey or south and east of Turkey. Then they said, why do we need a circular container to write on? Let's make it flat. See, of course, I don't know. Maybe it took 50 years, maybe 100, maybe 200. We don't know exactly. But uh, uh, probably it was not that long. But somehow somebody decided that if you made a flat clay tablet and write on it, it would be much easier and it would take much less place in the treasure of the king or the, or the, or the temple. So this is the first time that they switched to a flat clay. Kil tablet nedir biliyor mu herkes? Kil tablet biliyoruz. Kil tablet çamurdan düz elimize sığan el büyüklüğünde ve e, kuruttuktan sonra fırına atılan, seramiğe çevrilen tablet. Bütün yazılar, bütün belgeler, Sümer belgeleri bu. O olmasa biz bunları bilmeyecektik. Okay. Bir ara vereceğiz. İşte saat kaç şimdi? Dokuz buçuk mu oluyor? On buçuk, pardon on buçuk. On bira doğru çeyrek kala bir ara veririz. Bir on beş dakika ara. Sonra ondan sonra bir, bir, bir ders daha yapıp bırakacağız. Üç, üçe bölmüyoruz yani. <gülüyor> pardon. <gülüyor> Now, when we saw the tokens... A circular token with a cross was a sh presenting a ship. Another substance was representing another shape. The, the, the Sumerian said, that why we have to put together 100 tokens representing the, the, the ship? We have to find a way to just make a cross, meaning, uh, meaning ship, and then we have to put a sign, which means 10 or 20 or 100 or 65, whatever. They, they try to find a solution for that because, because it took too much place in the treasure of the king and the, and, and the temple. 
So they didn't have enough room. And it was very complicated. T to simplify it, they said, let's, in the beginning, the number and the, the, the, the, the, the, the name of the material was spe special token. So if you want to say five sheep, you had to make five tokens. 100 sheep, you had to make 100 tokens with a cross. They said, why do we make, are we stupid? Why do we make 150 tokens for 150 sheep? Let's find a way, simple, simple. <coughs> Let's put the cross and then find something else and then we know that it's 100. So that's how they switched slowly to number system. Because in the beginning, the number and the type of the material were put together. One token meant one sheep. So a, a token, circular token with, a, let's say, one line maybe meant a, a coat or something. So they decided not to have so many tokens to just create crowd in the treasure that forced them to find easier way. Then they invented numbers about 5,000 years ago. Now, the caveman, how would they, how would they talk about the animals? Now, you, you came to the, to the pazar and, and you have a sheep. You want to buy uh, chickens. What do you do? You say to the man, I give you one sheep just by, I don't know how they spoke or, or uh, probably they spoke. You give them five chickens. But in, before they speak, they showed it by sign. Five chickens. And then said, three. No, no, five. Four. Pazarlık yapıyorlar. İşaretle başka çare yok. Ve bu yavaş yavaş el sayıları sayılara doğru gidiyor. Roman rakamlarını hatırlıyor musunuz? Bu kaç? Bir. Bu kaç? İki. Bu kaç? Üç. Bu kaç? Dört. Bu kaç? Bakın şu, beş. Bir tane daha koyarsam altı, yedi, sekiz, on, şu. Hatırladınız mı Roman rakam? Bak, bir, iki bu, ve gördüğünüz bu el. Böyle açıyorsun ama parmakları kapatıyorsun. İkisini yan yana getirince de cross oluyor. Everywhere in the world. So what they did was just put a simple sign on a clay tablet. One, two, three, four, five, six... It, it's nothing ingenious, but it takes much less place than tokens. If you had 100 tokens, you had, it, it would take maybe this much place. But if you just wrote these numbers, it didn't take any time on a clay tablet. If you wrote, let's say, 59, it, it, it takes maybe just as, as big as your, your nail. So they save time and place and effort. Also, it takes lots of energy to make 150 tokens. Very simple, just like, like fingers. Now, if you look at the numbers, they are like, they are like this. In Turkish, they call it çivi yazısı, but in, in, in, in English, it's cuneiform. Şekli çiviye benzediği için çivi yazısı demişler. But actually, uh, uh, they didn't mean anything like, like nail, the Sumerians. What they did was very simple. They took a piece of wood, usually kamış, and then they made a very uh, uh, thin uh, pen, pencil, let's say. And then the tip of it, if you look at the cross section of it, it's like, like a triangle. You see? Now you have a triangle here. This is your pen. This is called stylus. Now, if you have a triangle here, 
if you just put it directly, you obtain something like this. But usually they didn't do that. They just put this side on it and then slightly just lowered it. Then you, took, you, you received this structure. So just the triangle, they could make all the shapes. But the reason why they switched to this is that when you try to draw a circle on a clay tablet, let's say this is a clay tablet, if you want to draw a circle, if you want to draw an elliptical structure, it's very difficult. How are you going to make a small circle? Maybe as big as this. You cannot do it. It, it, it will be messed up. So they decided to use something simple, and that's how they discovered the numbers. They said, very simple. I mean, you can ask the most stupid person in the world, and if you say this is 1 and this is 10, can you write the others? He can. Easily, he can do it. You don't have to be ingenious. Just write them together to save place, to save time. This was very simple. You just pressed on a clay tablet. That's it. But of course, you, you don't, in order to 59, you don't make 59 signs, you see? Because they invented 10, just like the eye of a person. So if you have two eyes, three eyes, 50, you can go up to anywhere you want. Then, of course, they had a symbol for 100, for 1,000, etc. We'll see them. Bazen televizyonlarda böyle kil tablete yazan insanlar filan gözük hiç öyle bir rastladınız mı kil tablete yazan İstanbul'dan biri var yazar görmediniz mi? Bulursam size ben bir video göndereyim. Yani şu anda zevk için yazanlar var. Okay. Now look at the Egyptian numbers the same. Just like everything comes from the, the fingers. You see one, two, three, four, five. Exactly. Based, they were separate from each other, but the mentality, the, the, the, the brain of people worked the same way. So they had very similar approach. See, I, I mentioned you the, the, the, the Roman uh, numerals. Brahmi, Hindu, Arabic, medieval, they were all similar. Sim simple symbols. Maya numerals, you see, şeylere benziyor, bahriyelerin rütbesine benziyor. But the idea is the same. You, you have some signs which represents the numbers. Now, after they uh, discovered that clay tablet was very suitable, and then you can see the exact sign of the stylus, you see? They said, why don't we go further and put together uh, the number and the, uh, the object? So this is the first and the oldest uh, clay tablet found in uh, Hasaka, Al Hasaka, Uruk again in Mesopotamia. Uh, probably we think that it's ten sheep. And Eskisubu. This is around again, fourth millennium, around 3,500 or something like that. Uh, you can see that this is a document. The hand over there is supposed to be the, uh, they think that it's the hand of the owner. It gives the number of the slaves. This is found again in Kish. The first step to writing alphabet. Now, you know hieroglyphs or, or pictural alphabet. So if you want to represent walking, you just draw the feet, right? You, it, it, when you draw feet, that means walking. So when you draw a man, He is probably man, but if you put something here, this is this is water. Dere böyle böyle akıyor ya. Put together means drinking. So, 
again, just like talking to each other by signs. When, as I said, when you say like this, I want to eat, I want to drink, drink. I want to walk when you draw a, a, a foot. So they start to, to uh, represent the words by simple pictures. Just like hieroglyph is, is, is similar. Muslim Egyptian hieroglyphs are similar. So the mentality of man is similar everywhere as the development takes place, as, as they develop they try to find more practical ways to present something. First they were communicating with science and then they began to put those communication technique onto writing. Now the cuneiform, we say chiviyaz, uh, of course developed in centuries. Now, as you can see, it was very simple. They had uh, first uh, the pictures. You see the man face, fish, etc. And then after a while, this, this is always uh, sun or star. So in some cases, star, but many cases it is, it is uh, sun or star. You, you can see that they are using simple signs uh, because you cannot draw circles or ellipse just lines they prefer to use lines because it's easier to write on a soft clay yani bir gözünüzün önüne getirin kilin üzerine yuvarlak çizseniz ya da elips çizseniz parçalanır o kadar küçük kalem yok yani çünkü bunlar bu, bu kadarcık yere yazıyorlar bu, buraya belki 10 sayfa yazı sığdırıyorlar çok küçük yazıyorlar okay so uh, it Babylonian time, Assyrian time, but this is early Babylonian, this is Sumerian. Now, first they had the pictures like this, look, you, look at the man, you see head. But later on, they put it 90%, they changed the angle for 90%. You see, this is vertical, this is uh, flat, as you can easily see. Now, this helped them to go to... Uh, a uh, much easier uh, way of writing. You see, this is exactly this, but it, uh, they don't look like each other. Look at the man. Has nothing to do with the picture of the man, you see? Totally different. This looks like a man, but this doesn't, this doesn't, because they did not want to spend too much time to draw different lines. They just want to press and take it out. Press, take it out. Üçgen bulur, bulursam getiririm bir daha derse. Bildiğiniz üçgen yapıyorsunuz. Sadece çamura bastırırken ya tam basıyorsunuz ya yarım basıyorsunuz ya da keskin ucunu basıyorsunuz. Şu ucunu basarsanız başka, tamamını basarsanız başka. Burayı basıp azıcık bastırırsanız şekiller başka çıkıyor. So as... Uh, the uh, time proceeds, they switched from pictorial or cuneiform, uh, from pictorial uh, alphabet to cuneiform chibiyas. Around from 3100 to 1000 BC. So uh, it has, again, you can see it has nothing to do with, with uh, the, the, the picture of man or, or uh, water. It's totally changed. Even, even, even the, the star became heaven. Oh, the, the, the idea of God living in the sky comes from Babylonians, Sumerians. Now, sometimes we say yedi kat gök. Öyle diyen anneanneler oluyor mu? Yedi kat gökyüzü lafı geçiyor mu hala? Yoksa yok mu artık o? Unutulmuş demek ki. Her zaman öyle konuşulurdu. Now, Babylonians said that uh, the universe is composed of seven layers. In one we have the sun. Oh, they said that it's a crystal sphere. Bayağı camdan küre olarak kabul ettiler. So we have a crystal sphere around earth. Sun is attached to it, gives us light. And moon is attached to it. Then he said, since they know about the planets, they knew, they followed the actions of the planets. They were good mathematicians. 
Sumerians, Babylonians, Akkadians, Assyrians, they are all living in the same place, but the emperor changes, so, but same people, okay? People are the same, living in different places in Mesopotamia, but the king changes. Hanedan the issue. Okay, so they said another one, they have the planets. And in the end, we have the stars, and then the God is there. God lives with the stars. So this idea comes from Babylonians. And they said that there is nothing uh, after the stars. I mean, they didn't know anything about galaxies, of course. So in many religions, this idea uh, was accepted. And most of the uh, beliefs in Christianity or Judaism, and some part of it is switched to, to, to uh, our religion, uh, the original idea, some of them were correct, some of them were wrong, of course, but the, the shape of, uh, of, of, of uh, universe, and they said that's end, and wherever God lives, there is nothing other than that. Şöyle bir laf söylerdi eskiden işte, yedi kat yerin dibine gir filan, o da mı söylenmiyor artık? Ha? O, oluyor, ha. Yedi kat gökyüzü, yedi kat yerin dibi, yani cehennemin dibinin dibi. So, many ideas that we have today actually come from calendar. Babylonians discovered calendar. They, were, they discovered mathematics. They discovered geometry. Now, many people think that's the Greek people were the leaders of development of science. That's not true. Babylonians, you see, uh, during Roman Empire and before that, Alexander the Great, Büyük Iskender, his, his, his, uh, his uh, travel from, from uh, Greece to, to Anatolia, from Mesopotamia to India, he learned, the, the Greek philosophers learned many things from the Babylonians and then when they went to Egypt, they learned from Egyptians and they developed it. Geometry was well developed in Babylonian times. So Thales, Babylonians knew Thales. It, we shouldn't call it Thales equation or Thales uh, rule. It was known by, by Egyptians. They used it and it's written document, but we still believe that, okay, Thales is the one. No, that's not true. Some of the inventions of, of, of uh, Greeks, actually they were not inve invention, they were uh, adopted from Babylonian philosophers. Calendar, as I said, numbers, alphabet, most of the things, they were the inventors. They were very smart people. Their mathematics was unbelievable. Geometry, they were perfect in geometry. Mathematics, no problem. They could solve any equation, anything. I mean, we didn't have, the equ I shouldn't say equation. Many mathematical and geometrical problems they could solve. Okay. Now, you may say that, okay, we don't understand anything about this. How did we understand what this meant, what that meant, and how did we understand the language of Sumerians, Babylonians, Akkadians, Assyrians? Assyria ile Assyria ayrı şeyler. Assyrian dediğimizde bazen karışıyor. Assyrians, ikisi karışmasın. Suriye ayrı bir yer, Assyrians ayrı. Asurlu, biz de Asurlu yazıyorduk ama karışabiliyor bazen. Assyrian İngilizce de biraz karışır. Süryani de dedikleri. Süryani aslında Suriyeli, Hristiyan değil. Doğrudan Hristiyan Araplar demek gerekir. Onlar pek hoşlanmıyor Süryaniler. Yani Hristiyan e, Arap olması lazım. Suriyeli demememiz gerekiyor. Ama karışabiliyor tabii. Ne yapabiliriz? Okay. Now, it was around 1700s that many uh, scientists, historians, archaeologists in Europe visited Mesopotamia, Anatolia to understand the um, previous civilizations because they knew that uh, there should be a civilization in Mesopotamia. But before that, of course, the first thing they discovered was Egyptian uh, civilization because pyramids never disappeared. When Romans came 
when Romans uh, conquered uh, Egypt, they were shocked to see the big statues, big pyramids. And they decided to have the, the reason why Greek people have so many statues is because they were influenced by the, by the uh, before that they didn't have any statues. When they saw the beautiful statues in, in, in, in Egypt, they started to make statues out of, out of marble. And the scientists came to Egypt and of course they excavated and they, they found many things about the uh, old Egyptian uh, civilization. But they didn't know much about Mesopotamia. But late, later on, some people came to Anatolia, came to uh, Mesopotamia, because they saw some signs of the former civilizations. So in simple excavations, of course, accidentally, you discover you are trying to make a house or a government building. You excavate the ground, and you find some archaeological material. Even today, we do, right? So Europeans uh, always wanted to discover the ancient civilizations for various purposes. And in, in 1764, a German a scientist came to Iran, and then uh, he saw the mountain, uh, and there were some human figures, and there were some writings, the very, very similar carving are found in Turkey also. Does anyone know where, in which city? Van, Vanlı var mı içimizde? Van da buna çok benzer, benzer aynısı. Üç tane ayrı dilde yazılmış metin var. So they had, the man was surprised to see that uh, there were three different writings and there were some carvings of soldiers and kings. Now Darius, Darius the first Persian emperor uh, wanted his artists to carve this carving. And then he, he wrote his um, uh, message in old Iranian language. And then since those people knew, the old people, scientists in, in Iran knew the previous languages, Elamanite and Akkad, the languages, so he, his, all his message were written in old Iranian, uh, Babylonian and Akkad. But of course, the, the, the, uh, the scientists who came to visit to see this didn't understand anything, but he, he just uh, wrote the, uh, copied the, uh, the, the scripts, the writings, and this was the first time that they copied writings. And then, uh, after a while, uh, they tried to, uh, the scientists tried to, uh, and, uh, uh, tried to understand the uh, uh, meaning of those symbols. And later on, it's disappeared. Dis disappeared. That means, çözüldü. Do you, did you hear about the, uh, um, uh, uh, disappearment of, of, of, of uh, hieroglyphs of Egypt, Rosetta Stone. Anybody heard about Rosetta Stone? Again, the scientists knew that there was a big civilization in Egypt, but there were many writings on papyrus or on, on rocks or in, on steles. They didn't understand anything. It took many years, no one understood, but somehow when uh, Napoleon uh, conquered Egypt, his soldiers found a big stel, stel büyük taş levha, yazılı levha. And uh, they stole it and took it to, to Paris. It's still in Paris, in museum. Did anybody go to Paris to see a museum, Louvre Museum? Gittin mi Louvre'a, görmedin mi? Ama tabi adını bilmediğin için görsem de önünden geçmişindir. Rosetta Stone. Şu boyda bir taş. So the messages of the fora of Egypt were written in, in, in, in hieroglyphs and then also in, in, in um, 
uh, in, in Greek, and there was another, I, I forgot now. So in same text were written in three different languages. Sorry, not French, I'm sorry. Three different languages all, of all times. It was the message of a fora. Uh, as I said, the, uh, there was always a competition between the priests, the temple, and the kings, and the palace. Because they were both powerful, and they were struggling with each other because they want to get uh, more power, perhaps more money. And there was always uh, some uh, conflict between the religious leaders and the kings. So Fora of Egypt had problems with the, uh, the priests of the uh, uh, Egyptian religion. And uh, there was a big struggle and the country was all messed up. It, several times that happened. Finally, they convinced the, the, the, the um, fora, the, the emperor, to sign some kind of a, a peace agreement with the priests of Egypt. Now, the reason the priests do not want the king to uh, uh, uh, control them because they want money directly to their to their temple, but to themselves, actually. They live like kings. Oh, Papa, he lives like a, maybe much, much better than the many uh, uh, presidents of the world. He is very rich. He has millions of dollars, billions of dollars of gold, because they, he, they, they kept collecting money since the beginning of Christianity. Well, anyway, so Fora had no chance because the country was all in, in turbulence, he, he, he made a declaration that from now on the priests can do, I mean, I'm just making up shortly, can proceed as they did before. That's a peace treaty. So he wrote it in three languages so that everybody could understand. So that helped French uh, archaeologists or French linguistics to, uh, linguists to, to, to solve the hieroglyph, because Egyptians didn't know anything about it, because they were just modern people, they didn't know about French. So this is very similar for Sumerian, but it, it was later than that. So, but Hittite writing and Hittite civilization, it took much, much longer, because people did not know anything in the world, that there were people living on Anatolia, and they had an empire, because everything disappeared. The, the reason. Egyptian civilization was known because they had the pyramids and the big statues. So when you excavated the pyramids, you found treasures, written documents, etc. But Hittites, they used just uh, mud, bricks, um, carpitch, everything disappeared they, it, it, all under the ground. So it took men. In, in, in, in um, Torah, Tevrat, they mention that about the communications of, of, of Hittite kings. Uh, but people didn't know where they lived. Also, there was communication between the fora of Egypt and, and Hittite kings. For instance, the Hittite king asked fora to send a doctor. I, I forgot the name of the, uh, the, the, the Hittite emperor, but anyway, to send a doctor. He says, because my sister cannot get pregnant, she cannot have a baby, but she wants badly to have a baby. Can you send a doctor? She can help her. And the Fora says, as far as I know, your sister is about 50 to 60 years old. It's impossible for her to get pregnant. But anyway, I will send you a doctor. So these kind of relations uh, were always taking place between Babylonians, Egyptians, Hittites, and, and, and, and um, uh, Egyptians. So these documents, of course, helped the scientists to find the unknown uh, civilizations buried under the ground. And also Hittite writing, oh, it has a, another story to solve the, the language of Hittites because no one in the world knew anything about Hittite language. So always th there are some accidental discoveries which helps them to, to, to disappear, disappear and chiffre chosmek, disappearance.